I've been a folklorist for, I'm in my fourth decade. <laughs> and uh, I've worked in a number of different parts of the country, New England, uh, Mid-Atlantic, the South, uh, some Midwest, Utah, Washington, uh, native Californian, did my training at UCLA. So I've bounced around, spent a, spent a year in Scotland. Um, and Emily essentially posed some questions to me, uh, mm -hmm. thinking about who the potential audience is. And uh, you know, I've met this half of the room. Who are you guys? <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> oh, okay. So essentially, these three in the back are the folks who oh. lobbied to bring the folk life, the former folk life program to Here. the University of Oregon. Yeah. Well, congratulations and thank you for that good work. Because <laughs> we're really happy that the program has a new incarnation, has risen like the phoenix from the fire, mm -hmm. and uh, is going to move forward. Um, what Emily had asked me to talk about specifically in, in this particular section was ways of integrating traditional artists into other kinds of arts programming. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to try not to be repetitive because I've got half my audience who've already heard me talk about something. So I wanted to start out just with uh, a couple of short videos. This is a program uh, that we started about a year ago uh, trying to repurpose some of our archival footage so that we could have some video presence and tell, have individual traditional artists and practitioners telling their own stories through video. And we're now in the process of shooting some new footage um, of a variety of other people. We started out calling it the Folk Arts Road Trip. But that got a little bit um, too long. and We decided to rebrand as Nevada Stories. And that also lets us go a little bit broader, uh, more to some of the fringe areas that we were talking about this morning where folk life and popular culture or folk life and other things intersect. So um, I'm going to start out with Elizabeth Brady. And most of the people who are on this list are individuals who received our Governor's Arts Award for Folk and Traditional Arts. So we interviewed them at length at that time uh, and had footage available from some of those kinds of interviews. Elizabeth Brady, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but it's been more than a year. <laughs> so I can show you her image. Um, and for each of these artists, we have uh, a web page giving a little bit of background, and then uh, people can go right to the video. So. What I'm singing about is these three little minnows as they're swimming. They're swimming under branches and uh, but they're talking and they're, they're going. I, you know how minnows all bunch up. There's little songs that my great grandfather used to sing. I could listen to it. I may need technical assistance to try to. I have lost. I have lost. Can we, I'm not sure if we can turn it. Is there a volume on the? Are you plugged in? I'm going to have to get out of. Somebody singing, and I could pick it up. Is it coming out of just a little speaker? It's just going to sound. Okay. Where is my? Audio. 
Yeah, I'm looking for my audio. We're not thinking that the audio is coming out of anything other than from our onboard speaker. Okay. And I'm looking for the onboard speaker. Which is all the way over there on this side. Okay, we'll try this again. You may get blasted because now I've turned it up.
provide a way for people to come to the website and find out about a variety of Nevada traditions and both living and passed on um, traditional artists. And that's one of the ways that, that we try to make the folk arts available to a wider audience, both in Nevada and outside Nevada. Washoe and Paiute and is very, very interested in learning the traditions and so we interviewed him about what he has learned from various people within his uh, tribe and family groups and uh, why, why he thinks it's important. You know, why, why would a nine-year-old spend a lot of time doing this? You know, why is it important for him? to have that cultural identity, which I think is, is also interesting to be looking forward rather than always looking backward when we're working with traditional artists. Okay, I want to show you another one. This uh, Northern De Nevada is, you know, primarily known for cowboys and Indians. That's what a lot of what we have in Northern Nevada, although in Reno and Carson City, we do have more diverse populations. But um, our major center of diversity is Las Vegas, which has 75% of Nevada's populations and very, very uh, diverse. And after this one, I'll show you a quick one with one of our uh, Las Vegas traditional artists. I was hanging and this is a Nevada artist singing also, but not the one from here. <laughs> I believe uh, that we're all born with uh, certain God given talents, and everybody has a creative, creative potential in them. Hopefully, you live long enough to discover what your creative potential is. Once you find it, you just can't get enough of it. It'll help you find your purpose in life. It was such a great interview. I mean, that's why I raised an occupational art in that you're exposed to it when you work on these big bands, you know, because there's always somebody on the crew, generally, who's a raw hider, and uh, everybody's horse here. And we seek out raw hide because it's, uh, it's the best quality. Now, horses, you know, we've all seen them, they're sensitive enough that, you know, they can react with flight problem all the time. Shake your back, and, and uh, so certainly they can feel anything that we want to any signal that we want to convey to them. Leather, you know, it's okay, but it's been tanned, it's been chemically altered, and it's somewhat, has somewhat of a dead feel to it. And we feel with rawhide, it's just live, it has a good live feel to it, and we feel with that horse, it's a much better opportunity to respond to our, our uh, request. Like say these hackamores here, the hackamores, and the center rawhide novels here, a, a, a two rain, two rain hack more there. First thing we gotta do is find the dead cow. So the cow dies, or, and we harvest the hide right off the cow, skin the cow, stretch it on the frame, dry it, scrape the hair, then we'll cut it into string, and we usually cut around and around the hide, make one long string like that. And we'll show, let me show you how we cut, cut a raw hide string over here. And now these are pretty, for a raw hide, these are pretty high tech tools actually. A lot of rawhide, some of the best rawhide that was ever made, was all just cut with a stick and a pocket knife. So a lot of, a lot of old timers, they never had access to tools like this. Frank Hansen from Lake New Oregon uh, kind of got me started. We worked with it at the MC Ranch. And uh, Frank helped me bring my first Brianna, kind of taught me how to harvest hide and how to judge good rawhide. So you sit in the bunkhouse and uh, work on a project together, you know, with somebody. And, and uh, you learn a button from one guy. And, learn a technique here and there, and then, you know, share that with the next guy. And uh, so all this stuff is taught word of mouth. It's something that, you know, right now we probably have, we have a lot of people interested in rawhide during the day. There's huge interest in it. Rawhide, you know, it has a constrictive property that binds. And in my life, you know, what I've found with rawhide, you know, it binds 
It binds us to our past. It binds us to our Western heritage. It binds us to friendships. And it, and it binds us to families because it's tradition. It's a cultural tradition. You know, we can take a cowhide and, and just old cowhide and, and convert to something like that. You know, that uh, to me is, uh, I don't know how to Here we go. On the far eastern side of Las Vegas, so rural that you can still ride a horse down the street, sits an unlikely collection of buildings, living quarters for Buddhist monks, and the headquarters of the Thai Cultural Arts Association. The driving force here is Supatra Chempachu, a native of Bangkok, Thailand, who spends much of her day passing on the cultural tra traditions of her homeland. My mother is a, a prominent dancer in Thailand, Thai dance. And I like dancing and I asked her to teach me how to dance and she said she, she was not allowed to teach me because like my body, I'm too short. I, I have very short uh, fingers, so I'm not equipped to be a dancer. Upon moving to Las Vegas 25 years ago, Supatra Chempachun noticed that no one was teaching Thai dancing. She had the exact knowledge that was missing. I know how the girls can do it right or, or, or wrong, and I can correct them all, all along the path. I don't go up there and dance myself, but I know all the dance and, and all that is required to, to be a good dancer. So I teach my girls. Supatra has been working so hard for the last 15 years that I met her. I have seen her work and it has been great. She has been sacrificing a lot of things in her life to try to take uh, her culture to this community. That way everybody understands what the Thai culture is in Las Vegas. It is important what she does for the community at large, but it is also very important what she does for her community to, to keep the connection between uh, their homeland and this new land that they live in. And it's important to know because it's good for your identity and to know where you're coming from to help you grow into a better person and know where you're going in the future. And what is happening because of what she's doing? We have an experience that we wouldn't get anyway for her own community, for the communities of uh, Mexican, Japanese, or whoever uh, lives here in Las Vegas, and we are from all over the place. And she makes this possible. to 
site was done on a free open source program on which people were not appropriately trained. <laughs> So there are often issues um, with the website, but the information, the core information is appropriate and um, seeing how we set up the rosters and the kinds of information that we provide, uh, not only for the artists, but for uh, organizations and schools who are interested in uh, bringing in traditional artists for a variety of things is, um, I think, important. So what we have initially is just a page where people can go and see the kinds of traditions. We also have educational resources online, and each of the individuals has their own roster page and they choose the information that they want to have on it. We do extensive interviews and fill out forms and try to get all of the information. We write up the bio, we send it back to them for any corrections. If they don't like it, we redo it. Um, we have them set their own fees, their own schedules who they would like to work with, um, what it costs to bring them, all of those kinds of things are available. And uh, it's our hope, right now we've got uh, about two dozen people on the roster, all of whom have either been in our Master and Apprenticeship program or have been one of our Master Artists with the Governor's Arts Award or a Nevada Heritage Award. So they're known quantities. We know their uh, expertise and ability to teach and to explain or demonstrate what it is that they do. Um, we have been funding roster residencies and, and performances through a direct payment program to the artists. I had funding through the NEA for the Folk Life Education Initiative which places traditional artists in a variety of, of settings to teach, demonstrate, talk about their traditions. Um, I'm trying to get away from that because I don't have time to be a booking agent and uh, it takes a lot of legwork uh, in order to, to do that. So we're going to be um, initiating a quick grant system a quick turnaround grant system for artist residencies that will in fact apply to all of our rosters, our, our arts and education roster, the folk life roster, and our Tumble Words Writers residency rosters, and schools and communities can apply for that. There'll be a uh, you know, very rapid turnaround, like six weeks uh, in advance of the, of the program. The only caveat being that they have to use people from our rosters uh, in order to apply for those grants. But it's kind of a different model. As you can see, the, we have a lot of performing arts in Las Vegas and a lot of material arts and verbal arts in northern Nevada and eastern Nevada. And that goes along with our demographics, our, our populations. Uh, we do have some performers. We're getting a few more in, uh, in northern Nevada and it's my hope that I'll be able to get out and do some more field work to contact some more of these people and also uh, get a few more of our uh, apprenticeship people uh, from the last couple of years um, on the roster. But that's just sort of a... Can I ask you a sure. Is this a place where um, your apprenticeship program applicants can, you know, can, because I know we'll only be able to award a certain amount, can, mm -hmm. would, would you recommend creating something like this for artists who are skilled but aren't getting those awards as another way that we can help promote them and support them though they can't? 
Well, I th absolutely, because not everyone wants to be a mentor and have an apprentice mm -hmm. and to engage in something that th that's that kind of really focused and directed work for, you know, eight to 12 months with a single individual. Um, and I think that uh, many of us are now starting to look at our apprenticeship programs and trying to see of ways that we can make those a little bit more flexible and think about things like uh, master classes. And I've had a couple of instances where people have applied for apprenticeships but are actually teaching master classes. They have, have a nominal apprentice, but then there are other people who are also coming and learning. Um, and to look at each, you know, each individual or each group and see what is the kind of folk life or traditional learning that they're interested in doing that's appropriate to the art form or custom or way and how they would like to share that um, and have them tell us what the project is rather than us tell them that they have to fit into these particular parameters. Yeah. Um, since you were saying that it's hard picking the roles of booking agents, does that mean that if somebody wanted to contact Andy Allen to do something, that then they would, that you all would coordinate that? Or would there be a way to have a artist roster with this kind of information, but with the artist contact information themselves? So that the artist contact information is here on this page. But No. Okay. No. So then what, so, so, there, so we could do this without taking the role of the agent. Yes, you can. You can. The, the problem is um, the marketing of the roster and, and the marketing of the traditional artists. And it takes several years to get the kind of um, knowledge about traditional artists and who's available to perform. Um, and, you know, I go, to, I go to teachers conferences with all the roster information. You know, I go to a variety of things with, with roster artists, always give out the roster information. But we still end up doing most of the, bro most of the brokering of, now, there are people who, I mean, I know that Andy, Andy does do a lot of storytelling uh, for Native events, uh, I don't know whether he's paid or not, but this information is available, you know, to anybody who's interested in booking. Um, the only thing that we say is that we do have some funding available to help if, you know, organizations are, are interested. And again, they have to be a unit of government, a tribe, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, did I say, or a school or, or university. There are certain categories of appropriate grantees uh, who we can give funding to. So for somebody who doesn't fit into the category where you would be giving funding, do, is there a way to make any money off of this, or does all the money go to the artist? Like if, if you well, it's up to the artist, it's up to the artist and I'll get into that in just a second of, of that's okay, of, of, of how to work with traditional artists outside this kind of structure. Um, and what we really wanted to do with this was, was to provide a place where the artists could have a web page, could have a web presence where the information would be available. They also all have uh, the edu appropriate educational standards for Nevada fourth and seventh grade, Nevada history, or whatever is appropriate for that particular individual artist so that teachers can go and say, okay, we're doing a unit on this. I need somebody who can teach something that fits into these educational standards, and that's all available on the website. And it's not something that most traditional artists will be able to put together themselves. Uh, in fact, I didn't put it together. We've got, you know, educational specialists who work in that area to, to put that together. 
Um, then we also have a variety of, of different kinds of activities and links to other kinds of educational things so that, that it's really um, providing a service to the artist as well as to the larger community. And I think by the schools seem to respond more um, if you provide them with a structure for getting a grant to do a project than just saying, we have these wonderful people, wouldn't you like to bring them in? They fit your education standards for this, that, and the other. For some reason, we have to go in the other door with that. So, But anyway, those are um, two of the ways that that we're working on, on providing um, a web presence for traditional artists and a way for them to market themselves. And we do update this annually. We go back and say, do you still want to be on, do you still want to be listed? Is this still accurate? Do you, you know, do you, do you want this contact information? Have you changed your fee schedule? All of those things so that there's an opportunity to uh, decide whether they want to be on or not. And of course, if somebody called and said, I don't want to be on the roster anymore, I would just take them down immediately. I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have to wait for the end of the year, end of the fiscal year to, uh, to affect that. Um, it's primarily about serving the artists um, and providing ways, providing access for the public to the artists. Okay, I'm going to get out of this now. I just have a question. So the links to the educational standards, were they on that page that we were seeing? Uh, yes. Would you like me to bring it back up and show you before I shut down? Okay, let me go to, I'll go to Mike Williams. Okay, where are Mike's? Well, now you have me stymied because I'm not seeing my link. Let me go back one. Oh, I know why. We had, there's a new um, set of standards and we're updating the standards and that's why they're, they've been taken down. But essentially, um, we do have lesson plans and activities here, and the standards will be back up at, really at some point. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they were right there on that page. Uh, they were the second page, actually. You yeah. could just, but I, I had forgotten that we had somebody working on that, mm -hmm. and I apologize. Okay, we're going to shut this down. Oh, no, I don't want it to do that. Well, okay. I didn't want it to go into whole configuring updates. And <laughs> no, 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 no. The machines all want you to be sure you don't want them anymore. <laughs> they give you many chances. So one of the questions that, that Emily had posed was, how can you diversify your arts rosters to include traditional artists? Um, and do you have arts rosters, or do you, you do? And do you have traditional artists on your rosters? Yeah, we do. We do so have, it's. Uh, and I, I guess I don't know the full definition of traditional artists. We have um, African music and dance, and we have fiddle, and jazz, and we have all these things. Mm -hmm. So you already have a very diverse artist roster. Yeah, we, and we're constantly looking, we 
to increase and increase the diversity of our roster um, to have different offerings um, that the students may not get in schools. I mean, of course, we're not getting a lot of arts. No, <laughs> anywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, that's sizable for a, for a county mm-hmm. organization. Is it any different for you to approach traditional artists than more fine art types of artists, or is your approach kind of similar whether you're... When I'm doing outreach or when yeah, I'm doing outreach? outreach. Yeah. Well, um, to get them on the roster? Yeah. Well, um... So it's my, I've completed one year at the position and a lot of the artists are already on the roster. Okay. Um, I have incorporated some uh, a couple new artists on the roster. And typically, um, it's Brian Green, mm-hmm. and we have a conversation, I have, but I now I'm trying to just more active outreach. Um, so in terms of outreach, um, I would imagine that it's, um, that it's different uh, in terms of identifying Is your is your roster primarily an artists in the schools yes. roster? So it's all focused on K twelve yes. education. Although we would like to expand our program to work in other areas, um, you know, whether it's um, hospitals and mm-hmm. physical therapy kind of settings, but right now we just work primarily in schools and after school programs. Well, arts and Arts and healing is becoming a really major field. Um, but I notice differences in terms of, um, well, I don't want to completely generalize, but, um, you know, we do, re- you know, uh, require, I don't want to say require, we prefer um, artists that have experience um, teaching and, you know, have a teaching certificate, although a lot of our artists don't. And, um, you know, especially some of our traditional artists, they, they would just have more experience in their field than a, an experience teaching more of an informal setting. And I've noticed on um, these like workshops we did this year, just teaching um, learning styles and how different they can be, um, and have some language is geared more for folks with teaching backgrounds than with others. And so, well, the Kennedy Center model is, is what a lot of areas are using, and they're looking for teaching artists who not only have expertise in an art form, but are also certified teachers and can write curricula. And that's not necessarily um, realistic for um, people whose first language is not English, for people who may not have any level of higher education uh, to be able to get a teaching certificate and depending on the nature of um, the art form and the type of residency it it may not even be appropriate what i really advocate is is partnerships between and what we're trying to foster through this new grant program is actually partnerships between the teacher or the presenter and the traditional artist so that they're putting together an educational program together uh, rather than just picking somebody who can demonstrate something or perform something have an actual face-to-face relationship between the teacher and the artist and talk about you know what are the goals and objectives of having them come in that we really don't as wonderful as traditional arts are, we really don't want them to be, you know, the, the popcorn. We don't want them to be the break from school. We want them to be part of the learning experience and teaching something, whether it's how to do a particular art form, uh, the relationship of, of that art form to a particular culture, uh, you know, there are a lot of different things that can be taught through traditional arts, 
and to have that partnership with, with teachers uh, and traditional artists working together to, to create the curricula rather than trying to fit what people do, in, again, into a particular box, a particular set of um, guidelines or rubrics that have to be met by the classroom teacher, particularly with all the No Child Left Behind and everything else, uh, is very difficult. And uh, as much as I appreciate what the Kennedy Center model does, um, I think there have to be other, other models and other ways that we can work with traditional artists in order to integrate them into uh, those kinds of school and community programs. Um, so I think uh, certainly one of the things that, that you need to look at as an organization is what are your organizational goals and objectives and how do those relate to traditional arts? Are traditional arts appropriate for helping you to accomplish your mission and goals? If they are, if, uh, you know, if you're not the opera society, <laughs> although I'm sure we can have some things from traditional arts that could enhance that, um, then it becomes um, a question of, what it is that you want to accomplish, who is in your community, who would be best be able to help you do that, um, and then doing the programming from there, rather than blindly selecting from a roster, which we have, to have somebody fit you know, something in. Another of the questions was, um, what kinds of resources are especially helpful for traditional artists when accessing arts opportunities? And we talked a little bit about that this morning. It really depends on um, the skill level of the, and the experience of the artist, uh, the education of the artist, the degree to which they're conversant with technology, there are so many aspects of both self-presentation and uh, working within educational programs that require specific knowledge and specific skill sets. And so those always have to be a consideration when working with traditional artists. You know, yes, this person makes, you know, fabulous ship -a -bow embroidery, um, but she's really shy and she doesn't want to work with children. Uh, so perhaps she's not the best person to do that. Although it might be that there's someone in her family or her community who would be very interested in being the cultural mediator or the translator to help present that in a way that's comfortable for the artist and still conveys the knowledge and information to the audience. So that's another thing uh, to consider with traditional artists. Um, other things, existing programs that are, can be helpful, all, any of the small business administration centers that have a variety of small business workshops, some of those can be helpful for traditional artists. Uh, things like the handbook that provides information, you know, in a single place is helpful. Things like uh, your programs here and your graduate students who can go out and work with traditional artists one-on-one -on -one with some of the business skills, marketing, things that they're learning through arts management are fabulous resources for you have amazing resources just here in this room for traditional artists. Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. There are a variety of public entities that provide free or low cost training that can be very helpful to traditional artists. They just need to know about them and, and gain access. And I think that's one of the ways that we can be helpful is that we can do the research, find out where those programs are, what they do, who's already teaching, 
you know, a basic web course, uh, a basic artist self-marketing course, uh, who's available, who's interested in doing uh, low-cost photographic work uh, in exchange for something uh, to work with the artist so that they have good photographs if they're putting together a press kit. All of those kinds of, of resources are, are really important for the artists and you know certainly your state state programs your county programs anyone who's already working with traditional artists and has any kind of grant funding or can apply for grant funding to do a project like doing a workshop for traditional artists on a particular subject i think those are those are all important kinds of resources uh, that you have available that can be helpful to traditional artists. We're closing in on five. Are there other questions? I have some, uh, some handouts, um, which are different from the ones from this morning. Um, one is on working with traditional artists and performers and it's about expectations and understandings. Uh, contracts, the focus of the performance and the demonstration, making sure that everyone is clear about what this, what's happening uh, and where, uh, who the audience is, the artist requirements, what equipment they need, what space they need. I remember working um, one summer at a festival and there was a dance troupe who danced barefoot and they were given a raised stage with a black surface in July in the South. <laughs> so we just took them off the stage and put them on the grass and moved the whole crowd back. But, you know, whoever set that up was not thinking about the artist. So this is so and so is going to lend us this stage not who's going to be performing and what do they need. And that's very often, particularly with small community and public events, that's very often the kind of thing it's, you know, I've got a barn, I've got a sound system, I've got, you know, we'll put it together. But, but the artists are central. The artists are, are the focus. So you really have to take care of them. You have to think about what they need. Um, I remember also talking to um, one year at the Smithsonian Festival, the, the country that was featured was Japan, but the state that was featured was Tennessee. And so the hosts um, took a great deal of time and energy thinking about feeding the Japanese and making sure that they had appropriate foods, you know, raw or stir-fried vegetables, sushi, things like that. And then you have these good old boys from Tennessee who, you know, if a vegetable isn't boiled for three days, it's inedible. <laughs> and, you know, even our most skilled culture workers didn't think about the fact that they were catering to one group, but that wasn't the only group who was there. And you can't assume just because somebody is native born that they're going to be flexible. <laughs> So there, you know, there are a lot of, of those kinds of things to think about. Uh, transportation to program sites. Do your artists drive uh, or do they need transportation? Is there public transportation? How are they going to get there? Um, and hospitality, just making them feel comfortable. Uh, I'm sure you've all experienced being someplace where you don't really feel at ease and nobody really clues you in on what's going on and and there's nothing familiar and then you're asked to do something and you're not really at your best uh, because you're not relaxed uh, it's uncomfortable and it's and it's really important uh, when we're asking people to share their culture with us that we do as much as we can to make them as comfortable as possible, to respect them, to honor what they're doing, to make sure that the audience respects and honors what they're doing. 
Um, then the other handout um, is one we talked a little bit this morning about ethics and etiquette, and this is just more information on uh, etiquette, fees, what performers need to know, um, those kinds of things for working with traditional performers. So I will hand these out, or Emily will hand these out. Or Nick will hand these out. Nathan will hand these out. Looks like Emily's got it now. I got it. There are two. There are two. <laughs> <laughs> you are a graduate assistant, aren't you? You must assist. <laughs> well, we're handing these out. I have a kind of funny story about a, an artist in, in Oregon who got an award to, to do poetry. They were taking poets out to small So he got one of these awards, and he went out there a little bit before the before the reading, and happened to run into the uh, the mayor of the town. So they went out and had a few beers before his reading. And then he got there, and uh, there was a crowd of little kids, their families, and uh, his first poem was Peckerneck. And uh, he was promptly asked to leave. So he sings it. Yeah, I I did a, a year long project on. Uh, in Tennessee and I was traveling all over the state with these um, absolute unrepentant redneck guys uh, telling local stories and and one of one of the favorite stories was about old Rojo the rooster who would screw anything that didn't move and uh, you know we would have to say okay for this particular audience um, <laughs> no, Rojo. Rojo is, we're not te telling the teachers Rojo, and we're not telling the children Rojo. When we have the adult concert tonight, you can tell Rojo. But that certainly is, is uh, one of the things in working with traditions, is thinking about what's appropriate in the traditional context versus bringing it into a new context, and, and how that's going to play. Yeah. Yeah, we've had those, when I was working as a preschool teacher for a decade, we had those issues and we had people in sometimes as performers. And um, the one, you know, traditional um, songs of some sort, the big issue was um, um, songs that have religious stuff, so there may not be, you know, bad words or anything. And um, there was one instance where um, the gentleman who was playing said, well, it's a good song. What's wrong with the song? Why can't I do this song? So really kind of well, and yeah, I mean, if you're presenting a gospel group, yeah. you have to go to Jesus. It just it's, it's there. Uh, there's no way around it. Um, but also, you kind of expect that if people come to hear a gospel group, they understand, or that you, as the interpreter, can say, you know, this is this kind of music. This is what it means in the community. This is what it's for. It's praise music. Uh, yeah, I think it's in some interesting questions. Uh, is it presenting yourself as a, a dissenter? You know, I mean, these are obvious sorts of things where it's pretty clear what you're doing, but sometimes it becomes difficult about what questions are added, what questions are supported. Well, and what collections are, What to what degree is there public access versus right private access with archival collections, certainly, uh, and whether things are only available to scholars or if they're going to be publicly available, uh, you know, digitally through the web. Very difficult. And I'm not a great believer in censorship, but I work for the state, and so therefore I have to, I have to walk a line. Do you have your programs come with um, not for Jesus or or dirty lyrics or Rojo. You know, they don't much come into my office. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, the arts in general uh, is one of the. Our our budget was cut fifty three percent. So, you know, we're trying to still do as much as we can with a much reduced budget. I'm fortunate in that my program um, 
has a separate, I have to write a separate grant to the NEA for specific programs and initiatives that's separate from our partnership grant. So I'm not totally reliant on the NEA partnership grant, but if they like the programs and projects that I want to do, then I get a little bit more money. So I'm in a little better shape. Yes, so Doug. How does the Arts Council deal with the artists that are associated with sort of the entertainment that happens in Las Vegas? Because I've been there for various conferences, and they bring people in who are um, costume makers or uh, lighting specialists or those sorts of arts. And so how, how does the Arts Council accommodate those people? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Um, they don't really, because there, there are a couple of places where they could come in for grants, like in design arts. We used to have a design arts category, but again, because of funding, that's been suspended right now, so there's not really a place for that. Yeah, maybe I didn't ask the question right. I mean, what, could those artisans be on a roster? Um, They probably could be. It's not really a function of the State Arts Council to, um, you know, have a trade roster for the Las Vegas entertainment industry. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm still not getting the question right. So, for example, I met a woman who made boas for uh, the, the, the showgirl. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't really a trade. It was something she did, and they would buy those things. And so it would seem that that kind of work fits on uh, a roster of some type, uh, but I'm not sure how it, how it fits. Because it's certainly art. It certainly might be thought of as being both, both, certainly both life because of its association with the, the dancers who are using that material. Um, so, so I'm just curious about how it might be accommodated. What I'm hearing is it's, it's not. It's, well, if it hasn't been it hasn't been an issue and um, you know I'm not sure we do have some other kinds of costume makers who uh, traditional embroidery for example for folklorico costumes um, and he has taught some master classes for us and that might be the the, yeah. the kind of place for that kind of person, but we would have to know about them. Right. And uh, right now we're spread so thin, I have no time for field work. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, just, I was just thinking, it seems like there'd be a lot of capital associated with that, those enterprises and that could uh, you know, be accessed in some way. <laughs> yeah. yeah to, to support you know, the kind of work you're doing. Right, and another really interesting community in Las Vegas is the um, Russian circus performers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a large group of Russian immigre circus performers who live in Las Vegas, some of whom work in some of the circ shows and some of whom make Las Vegas their home and actually have traveling, still have traveling troops. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another really interesting yeah. sort of semi-marginal, and certainly in Russia, it's considered an art. Uh, there's a Russian circus school that's on the, on a par with the Bolshoi, so it's, uh, circus is, is considered its own art form in Russia. Um, and that's one of the things that some of the performers have found really difficult in yeah. being in America is, is, you know, that being more associated with carnival and the carnies and uh, people who are a little bit shady and, you know, out to trick you and steal your money and, you know, those kinds of things. So it's, uh, but there are, yeah, certainly in Las Vegas, there are all kinds of different interesting groups. The, uh, the Basques down there, uh, rather than being uh, from sheep herding traditions, were brought over as high lie players in the early days of the casino. So they have completely different yeah. traditions than those in northern and eastern Nevada who are ranchers or came over as ranchers and became restauranters and hoteliers. So there's, uh, yeah, there, there's plenty of unplumbed yeah. depths of uh, different kinds of subcultures 
in Las Vegas. And uh, maybe we could talk about student internships yeah. for uh, mm -hmm. field work. Yeah. <laughs> Going to Vegas. Go to Vegas. Yeah, who are you, who's usually the user for this type of um, support that you're providing? It's not geared toward the artists themselves, but to like an end user who is an end user who is uh, a community organization or entity. Uh, like a, a festival. A festival coordinator, uh, mm -hmm. people in museums, mm -hmm. um, gotcha. people in various aspects of local tourism mm -hmm. who want to um, broaden the kinds of offerings that they have in their community by looking at who are the traditional artists in the community and how could we bring them mm -hmm. forward to be a community feature. Mm -hmm. um, those are the kinds of people. Um, do they find you then and look for this kind of material? Or they kind of sort of get <laughs> sent to me <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and then I provide them with that kind of material. Okay. But I have done, um, some of those materials came from uh, some workshops that I did um, in Puerto Rico for the National Association for Interpretation, um, focusing specifically on uh, cultural festivals and working with traditional performers. And these people were from museums, zoos, wildlife parks, a whole wide variety of uh, different kinds of interpretive management, but they were all very interested in either producing festivals or finding ways of focusing on existing indigenous festivals mm -hmm. and interpreting those. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go out and figure out who needs this information. They often find you, sounds like. Well, I think everyone needs this information. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I have, because um, the person whose office is next to mine is the community arts development uh, coordinator. She works with a variety of different arts and cultural organizations on the community level, on the county um, and community level. And so she sends people to me all the time. Any other questions, comments, needs? <laughs> well, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you.